was in my homiletics class, uh, my professor always said I did well delivering, but my, my notes and my uh, outlines were horrendous, and he couldn't follow anything. So I got always got Ds on my outlines. Uh, so my notes were scattered across like three, two books and one piece of paper. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to get all my thoughts together here, and uh, hopefully this will be okay. I get the impression sometimes when I when I do these things that it's uh, like preaching to the choir or uh, carrying coals to Newcastle. It's you know like you're just tell, telling people what they already know. So uh, that's okay. This is okay. Uh, I just want to pray again. Is that alright? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Uh, Heavenly Father, God, I always believe that you uh, desire to commune with your people, and tonight, Lord, uh, commune with us. Uh, if you can't speak. Uh, through me, Lord, than to speak in spite of me. Lord, I love you, and, and uh, let's open up your word and let's learn something tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, now that that's over. Um, Acts chapter 2, that's where our text is coming from. It's kind of a lengthy text. Uh, I hope it's not too long and too burdensome. Uh, I'm going to try to read it, and you're going to have to read this one. Bear with me for a moment. Uh, am I loud enough? Can you hear me? Can you hear me without it? Probably neither, right? Yeah. Okay. Alright, um, Acts chapter 2 is right here on your paper, if you need one. Alright, begin with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly the sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together and bewildered them, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not these all men speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews... All of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. It's not a really deep theological statement there. It's just, they're not drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then I skip down to verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all of whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. That was all text. Uh, one, uh, you can't ask me to do this. Uh, he said I was his backup speaker. <laughs> and so if the original couldn't come, then I was the, I was the backup. So if this doesn't work very well, then it's because I wasn't the original plan. <laughs> you were the plan of the Father. Yeah, so, so. Okay. Just all right, so when, when he asked me to do this, I, I came up with a couple of questions that I thought... Um, basically that I wanted to answer. I mean, the first question is, what exactly is the church? Uh, the second question is, what does it mean to actually do church? And then finally, uh, 
Jen's question that, that you wanted me to really focus on uh, was how do we be relevant then to the world, to the culture around us? And so approaching the first question, I, I thought, what is, it, what is the church exactly? What is the church? And what does it mean to be the church? And when I look at this text, I, I realize that it's at Pentecost that the church was born. That's, that nothing that the church had not existed until this moment. That it's on this moment that the blood-washed, spirit-filled church of the living God is born. And it's born at Pentecost. This is when the church comes into being. Right here at this moment. Right? And it, it comes into being uh, with, with, with power and with authority, with signs and miracles and wonders. This is how the church is born. And 3,000 people come to the Lord in one message. And that's the beginning and the foundation of the church of Christ. Right there. That moment. It's the church of born. And in 2,000 years, the church has spread over uh, hundreds of languages and hundreds of cultures all over the world and, and, and hundreds of different types of soil. The, the gospel seeds have grown and they have spread. We find churches uh, buried underground with people who, who raise their hands uh, to, the, to, to feed. They're, they're afraid and they're trembling, but they, they're secure in their faith. And they raise their hands e even though they know that the, the governments and the tyranny they live under kill them for their faith. And they do this. Churches can be found in the in the old stone buildings whose towers kiss the old world skies. We can see the churches in, in, in Europe and these, these ancient cathedrals where people worship. We find these small, tiny little churches buried in the in the hills of North America where people worship. We find churches in the jungle. Churches all over the world. But what is the church? I know immediately when most people, you ask them this question, especially in my culture where we come from, the U.S., they, they draw an image in their mind. They draw the, the, the white church uh, with a little steeple, you know, and you open the doors and you see all the people, right? And that's, that's what they draw in their mind. But is that is that what the, the Bible says when, it's, when, it, when it speaks of the church? But what is the church? The church is not a building. Uh, recently, I, I went back to Korea. We went to the church that where Ken and I both uh, worked at, and it's gone. The building is gone. Uh, they tore it down, and they're building a new one. But it's gone, and I was shocked. I, I took my wife there, and we walked through there, and I was shocked to find this empty, open space with all this construction going on. It's gone. And the, the building was brand new when we worked in it three years ago, four years ago. And now it's, now it's gone because they're building a bigger one. The buildings don't last. The churches don't last. The walls don't last. Like the stained glasses, they don't last. And it all crumbles eventually. It all fades away. The church is the people. It's the people. That is the church. Uh, when I was in college, I had the privilege to go on a mission trip to, to Africa. And one time, uh, several of, our, of us, we, we hiked along Lake Malawi to this tiny little village. It, it couldn't have consisted of more than maybe 200 people in this little village. And I remember that they had two churches, two different denominations in that village. They had an Anglican church in the village on one side of the village, and on the other side of the village, they had an Assemblies of God church. And they were just right in the middle of this, this tiny little village, two churches. And we came there, and, and, and we wanted to have like a little service. And so we met with both pastors. And one night while we were there, we had dinner with both pastors in the, in the Assemblies of God uh, house, the, the pastor's house. And I remember they had dirt floors, and they had uh, this, this thatched furniture, this homemade furniture, and we're sitting on it. And uh, it's dark. And the rain's beating on the tin roof, or on, the, on, the, on the roof, right? And we're, uh, the fragrance of chicken and rice is still lingering in the air. And they, and they have uh, this tiny, single uh, oil lamp giving this golden glow across the room. And there are people from four or five different continents in this, in this tiny little room, this little jungle in, in the continent of Africa. And they begin singing this song, and it goes, Ba, ba, wang, bing, bing, wei, wei. I sing this over and over again. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know, this is a simple song so the foreigners can sing it. But it, it, here we are, people from all over the world. We don't even share the same language. We don't have the same background. We don't even have the same denomination. And yet, we're together in one spirit, 